Mr. Rex Costley from TxDOT, successful implementation of steel coating and other rehabilitation projects, the importance of oversight. Good afternoon. Um, I'll try not to bore you. I know this is the last presentation, uh, but uh, this is, a, uh, I think, a very good presentation on how to uh, maintain a bridge and give it some more life. A uh, little TLC goes a long way. So real quick, just table of contents, just going to run through the table of contents. We're going to focus on steel coatings, the importance of steel coatings. And then we're going to button up with uh, structural repairs, uh, major rehabs. And the Queen Isabella Causeway in, in, our, in our area is considered a, a super bridge or a mega bridge. And uh, it needs a lot of attention. Um, and then we'll talk about our plan moving forward. So just a, a synopsis of where the FAR district is. Our brothers to the south, Mexico, that's kind of where we're at. And um, this is just a demographic of, of what the FAR district consists of. Um, just a net snapshot of Texas bridges, uh, a little over 35,000. And for the eight county area, we have 728, a little bit of tw uh, 2%. I, do, uh, I am proud that we are above our state average as far as the sufficiency rating, but we only have that many bridges, but they're long bridges as well. And this is a snapshot, if anybody has been to South Padre Island, it, uh, it is very, very pretty water. Kind of rival, rivals a little bit of Florida water. Not as pretty, not as clear, but there are times when uh, it is pretty. But that is your main land from uh, connecting two, uh, two entities. And uh, in summer, it does get uh, pretty jam-packed. So some facts on the Queen Isabella Causeway. Uh, basically, it connects the two uh, entities, South Padre Island and Port Isabel. It was constructed in 73 and 74, uh, 2.36 miles. Uh, I still think that it's the longest bridge over water in Texas. It is uh, 150 pre-stress uh, type 4 beam units, 80 foot spans. And then we have a 750 foot long burial depth uh, plate girder, 3 span continuous unit, about 150,000 square foot of steel, uh, 78, foot, 78 foot vertical clearance. And four days after September 11th, an errant vessel struck uh, the bridge, causing 320 foot of uh, bridge to collapse. And uh, the steel coatings have been uh, in 82, 97, and 2010. Uh, our next one is uh, slated for 2020 plus. So with that, you look at the, the maintenance cost over the Queen Isabella Causeway since 1997, other than prior to 97, there was really much uh, maintenance uh, uh, investment, uh, but it started getting interesting when we started putting cathodic protection into uh, our, our footers, our, our substructure elements. And that right there is just a tally of uh, how much we've invested into the, into the bridge. And we believe in this investment because if we would have just uh, looked the other way, we'd be looking at replacement a whole lot uh, earlier in the game. So some bridge elements. Uh, pretty straightforward, just the uh, approach and roadway side. And you can kind of see the magnitude of how long that bridge is. Uh, basically, Port Isabel is on the, uh, I guess you could say, the west, west side of the, of the area, and South Padre Island is on the east side. And this is kind of your pre-stressed concrete beam units uh, with internal diaphragms, your multi-column bent with, tri uh, with tie beams, and that's your waterway through the main, through the main uh, uh, intercoastal. Uh, this is just an underside of the uh, three girder system. I know that we don't do three girder systems anymore. It's more four girders to avoid that redundancy. And now uh, we're going to tie into the existing conditions prior to the 2010 steel coating operations. So here on these 8x8 eight eight, uh, square tubings uh, that frame up the unit, uh, we saw a lot of this, we saw a lot of localized corrosion where you basically just uh, have a cavity and it grows. Um, then we have accumulation of water where the internal stiffeners and your bottom flange tend to collect water and then you just start seeing a an acceleration of corrosion. Uh, and then we uh, sound some areas and you find some holes. It's not as thick as it once was. It starts to eliminate, uh, your nominal thickness gets thinner and thinner. And then we also have pack rust that finds ways that uh, we're, we weren't too sure that it could find, but 
over time it just kind of breaks welds or just pushes things where uh, they don't belong. These angles that make the uh, secondary members or your internal diaphragms, they find ways of just uh, collecting water and uh, it's only a matter of time until the pack rust continues. So that, in essence, is kind of a, a generalization of um, the, the failure of the paint system. The main units or the main elements, they were in relatively good condition, but these connections were giving us uh, some challenges. So, so our improvement basically was obviously to blast clean with steel grit, to uh, basically address all the deteriorated areas with new structural steel, and we uh, spec'd out a system three uh, zinc-clad marine paint system. I guess the Cadillac of all paint systems in our in our inventory, and it consisted of priming, intermediate epoxy coating, and the appearance coating. And that's just a snapshot of what that uh, product looks like. So. Some of the challenges that we had is that, again, that 2.36 mile long bridge, they only got two lanes of traffic going each way. And when the contractor shows up, they bring basically everything and the kitchen sink. And that was a challenge for us because the painting operation extended through spring break and through July the 4th. So that was a challenge in itself. Um, classic, classic rigging containment. Uh, that's the view looking towards the uh, port, uh, South Padre Island side. Uh, just a snapshot of what the rigging uh, looks like and just an overall of the uh, main, main girder unit. Then uh, good old fashioned removing pack rust uh, through uh, just uh, uh, slapping or smashing a plate steel into the crevices. Uh, we also did water blasting. I don't have a photo of that but a uh, combination of that. We also did the blasting basically with steel grit and you can see the employees there picking up the, the uh, finished product and uh, even the pedestals uh, full blown on the bottom you can see some pitting over, over time of what, uh, what that has done and this is where it gets real interesting because of blasting what it does to your uh, steel that may have been you know exposed to uh, the elements over time so that, that right there in essence is about 40 years old of enduring several hurricanes and just the uh, corrosive marine environment. A couple of other areas where I guess when you just get some uh, points of corrosion it starts growing and this is what you're kind of left with just uh, uh, thinner sections uh, over time. And then that pack rust that kind of goes from the gusset plate to your square tubing underneath it finds its way uh, and pack rust just kind of develops. So this is some good old engineering where uh, you know, we invite our neighbors up to the north in Austin, our bridge division. They come down and we do a full-blown inspection and uh, I appreciate these types of drawings because we don't see them anymore, especially in my office. But this is where the collective effort of, of the engineers and the inspectors come in to treat some of these areas. And it starts with hand drawings like this and then follows up with uh, engineering drawings. And on your lower right hand corner you see uh, on the title block change order because that's basically what it, what it comes down to. We don't have a crystal ball on, on what the uh, elements are going to be so it's kind of hard to identify what the repairs are but uh, we had a very uh, a good cooperative contractor that understood that uh, uh, repairs were needed but then again they knew that we were going to pay them. So. And another snapshot of just the various repairs mainly those uh, square tubings. Sometimes you had failures on the side, sometimes you had them on the top, on the bottom. So we, uh, we were pretty uh, innovative on the specifying the types of repairs to, uh, to uh, maintain that uh, secondary member. And then we also had a shoring plan that uh, whenever the contractor had to cut those square tubes, they had to shore it in place utilizing the existing uh, girders to keep it in place. So that 150 foot, uh, 150,000 square foot unit, uh, I'm not too sure if you can see the graphic as well, but all these nodes, all these little uh, legend areas, it consists of whether a weld needed to be placed, whether a hole needed to be repaired, um, whether a tube needed to re be repaired, uh, your uh, angle needed to be clipped. There was just a, a, a slew of repair efforts uh, of addressing this and it was continuing as the blasting continued. 
So uh, we would find repairs right after the shot blast or the uh, priming operation and uh, it would just continue. So this was kind of an ongoing effort. But with the repairs uh, that the contractor and, and us uh, quantified, they were pretty, uh, pretty innovative and, and worked with industry to have these uh, repairs shot primed uh, out in the, out in the uh, and fabricated as such. So that exp expedited some work. And that right there is a side piece of a tube connecting. That's either a top, side, or uh, top or bottom, I should say, uh, piece that connects. And basically this looks like your completed uh, uh, continuation of that steel tubing that was compromised earlier. Uh, and basically, we basically, you can say, lap weld splice onto the existing to make it whole. Uh, and then you, you could have some areas that were uh, beyond that where they were either hold or uh, thin and basically we just lap weld on top of those pieces. Uh, clipping some, uh, some ends on your internal diaphragms uh, basically and grind smooth and filling up those connections underneath uh, with, uh, with a weld. So this is the contractor's diary of how many repairs they were doing at each specific location. And you can see that, that it has grown. And just like any type of uh, uh, containment system, the uh, repairs are going to grow. So real quick on the uh, steel coating operations, you could see in the yellow, that right there was the uh, yellow paint from the 2000, no I'm sorry, the 1995 uh, painting system. So uh, we were fortunate or we were glad that uh, the paint was there. <laughs> and then here is your, inter uh, your striping or your intermediate coping, uh, coating where you have your stripe coat. And it has a contrasting uh, color to verify that the contractor did do his job. And uh, obviously labor intensive of getting in through every nook and cranny of trying to provide that coating system and obviously the final appearance coat and uh, just to kind of give you a graphic that that over the uh, the the depth of the girder over the uh, over the the support is 16 feet uh, high so it was a pretty intense uh, girder and some more pictures of the finished product and you could see kind of at the connections down below you'll see uh, the repairs that were uh, provided uh, to make that system hold again finished product of uh, that type of repair and obviously a lot of things happening in that connection but uh, we feel confident that the repairs that were done will yield some life up close picture uh, down below you can see where some of that water has accumulated over time you get some pitting on that bottom flange but uh, obviously that was corrected and uh, uh, the water to, to drain away in between, just an internal diaphragm painted, as well as the pedestals. The pedestals are showing its age over the over time, but again, that was a that's 40 years in the in the making. So, some of our success, uh, our successes in this uh, steel coating operation. Obviously, we had a good third party NACE three inspector. We had a we had a good painting contractor. I do have to say that he was uh, he wasn't in it for the money. He wanted to do a good job. Uh, we had a good structural steel repair contractor. Uh, he knew that uh, coming in that there was going to be some repairs, so he worked with us. Uh, I do have to say we had an excellent structural steel inspector because that was coming out of bridge division, so I do have to mention that. And we also had uh, excellent bridge division support uh, with respect to the turnarounds, the RFIs, the shop drawings. They were hands-on. They came from Austin all the way down. Uh, but yet we have good food and good fishing, so maybe there was a reason why they wanted to come down and an excellent beach. And then also with these jobs, uh, it can kind of get a little bit crazy as far as how much money continues and continues in the overrun and, you know, when are you going to stop the bleeding? So I do have to thank uh, division management for footing the bill on some of these uh, overruns. But this right here kind of says, uh, says it all that you need to have that inspection. You need to trust and verify. Trust, but verify, per se. And that's our NACE 3 inspector, so every nook and cranny. So that kind of sums up uh, the, uh, the steel coating operations. And some of the lessons learned that we took from this uh, operation was, you know, 
that's the lane line uh, that's the main lane uh, or the main viaduct to connect the two uh, entities and um, you know, with summer uh, that extends really from March spring break all the way to Labor Day it is pretty hectic and we do get complaints from the entity it's real nice when they claim that the bridge is theirs when everything is is nice and and uh, and uh, going everything smooth but whenever there's complaints, they blame, they blame TxDOT for some of the concerns. So we just run with it. We also need to strengthen some of our nodes with respect to post-blasting uh, operations. I think we need to have that foresight that things are going to happen, and we need to build some time in the, in the contract to allow for that to happen, to give us some time. And uh, some of the things, my little pet peeve is to avoid metal-to-metal -metal contact with rigging. I mean, as simple as uh, cutting a garden hose and wrapping around some cable uh, will we'll make it a long way. And then um, and and we also need to include some provisions on rounding some sharp edges, some knife edges to avoid premature, you know, uh, uh, failure at the uh, 90 degree angles per se. And then the big one here is knowledge transfer for the next generation. We got uh, about another seven years to go. and. We need to transfer that knowledge over to the next generation so that they can uh, uh, utilize some of these lessons learned. So that sums up our steel coating operations. But with that, outside of the 750 foot long uh, main girder unit, we've got 150 uh, simple spans, 80 foot spans of concrete elements. And I consider this a major rehab. Uh, but, but going back to this, uh, our leaders had some foresight to uh, find out what that service life assessment would be. How can we push the envelope with extending the queen's life? The theme is, you know, long live the queen as opposed to, you know, dethrone her per se or off with her head. So what we wanted to do is, is basically extend that life and come up with a systematic approach on how to get there. Obviously, we saw 33 million spent on the bridge. That has carried us a long way, and, and we're not in the business of just replacing bridge just to replace bridge. We're, we're trying to extend that life. So this right here is a, a good, I guess you can say, marching orders uh, for us on how to extend that life. So there's several strategies, and I'm going to kind of run through them, but it's pretty straightforward. If you don't do anything, the bridge is going to fall down, and how, much, how many years are you going to get for that? And then the other strategy is employing remediation plus, uh, or, or basically remediation, uh, remediation and routine maintenance efforts to, ex to optimize the surface life. And then employing that comprehensive uh, remediation efforts, getting down to what's really causing some of the problems. And in this case are the beams and the lower substructure elements were the driving force. So if we replace the bridge back in 2009, it was going to cost $125 million. But now I'm thinking that price is a lot more because of all the environmental impacts that we have to uh, um, jump over, per se. Uh, we do have uh, seagrasses that seem to uh, be a, uh, a big uh, uh, hurdle for some of the, some of the challenges within the, within the area. And the mitigation alone is, is uh, very, very costly. And then also the service life, or basically the baseline, is to keep the bridge at legal load, 80,000 pounds. Once we start getting below 80,000 pounds, things get interesting, calls get uh, forwarded to our office, is the bridge going to fall down, is it safe? Sometimes the public doesn't understand the significance of what a load posting is. So that's our baseline. And then other than that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's really no, there was really no significant maintenance efforts for the first 20 years. And then when the cathodic protection came into play, that's, that's, when it, the interdu uh, that's when it started happening as far as maintenance efforts are involved. So what you see here is just a, a simple bar chart, but I want you to focus on the first two columns that show um, the first column there is uh, precast beams. And you'll see that uh, brown color of basically doing nothing. And we'll extend it to year maybe 2023 before we start getting a load posting. But if we implement some uh, remediation efforts, we gain some life. And if we do that comprehensive effort, well, then we gain some more life, maybe to 2043. So that is an executive summary of that life assessment. And not so much for your pile cap and tie beam. You can kind of gain some life. And then the higher that you go up on your upper columns, if you really don't do anything, you'll still go exceed that 2070, 
whatever that criteria is. And it makes sense. We don't have problems with our bridge deck or our upper caps, but we do have problems with our lower substructure elements and our beam ends. So basically option one, which we've already done, it kind of gives you a summary of all the, the large dollar, the large ticket numbers of, uh, of addressing uh, option one, basically our marching orders. And we completed this back in 2010 and 2013. You'll see some slides on some of the rehab efforts. And then option two, uh, basically implementing option one, which was that 6.5 million, and then introducing uh, the controlling elements to the pre-stress beam ends, and then also a repainting effort of, uh, like I mentioned, 2023 plus. So all this, obviously all these repairs were completed and then we have this 1.23 million that you'll see some of the photos of the uh, rehab uh, efforts that we did. Obviously that was completed as well. And then, then option number three, that's where we get into a reapplication of the cathodic protection. Uh, that sacrificial layer has already kind of thinned out, blistered away, and uh, we're at a point where uh, we're in, in works with a, with a consulting office to give us a, a closer look at how much remaining life that cathodic protection is. And we're determining whether we need to uh, pull that trigger and implement another reapplication. So option one and two, you sum that up, 14 million, and then you start looking at the other large ticket item, which is the cathodic protection. Uh, these are planned, obviously, but the work that we've done so far obviously gets us to that 20, 30, 20, 40 time frame. So we're pretty happy with that. Um, we're looking at, we're really shooting for a 70 year design life um, and carrying it all the way to 2043. And obviously the controlling elements are the pre-stressed beams, the ends, and the substructure elements, like I mentioned before. And I'm really proud to say that, that in that assessment, they rated that the queen is, is in relatively good condition considering the corrosive environment. So what we need to consider moving forward is Basically, we've already committed to option three. Um, we need to be mindful of the fourth painting system because every time that you scrape away the paint, it gets thinner and thinner. Uh, we also have to be mindful of the reapplication of the cathodic protection. They were talking about applying cathodic protection along the beams. I'm not too crazy about that, but again, it's, it's my biased opinion. But we'll have a second party uh, provide us recommendations. And then we also have to do a life cycle cost uh, analysis uh, to evaluate the benefit, uh, uh, the replacement benefit ratio. For now, it makes sense to maintain the queen. And then we have something planned in fiscal year 19 for about a million dollars, more routine rehab efforts. And uh, basically, we're moving forward that we believe that if we implement the right treatment at the right time, uh, the queen will uh, stay, still stay standing uh, beyond 2043. So some photos here on the rehabilitation efforts. We got a lot of this kind of close to the water. Um, it just grows. Uh, fishermen, boaters, they kind of scrape up, up against the, the girders and um, that's what happens. So we come back shortly thereafter, uh, patch that up. That joint, even though it, it doesn't look bad, but that's 40 years of service. Some of the other locations, that back side of the, uh, your anchor studs uh, basically push out and you get spalls on your uh, bridge deck. So we wanna address that through replacing the armor joint, just leaving the steel in place. And then this is where the controlling element is, where back in the day in the 70s, uh, I believe, I, I may be wrong, but whenever the beams were, were cast, they just cut right through it and they really didn't recess and put an epoxy coating to protect the beam ends. So this is what was done in that rehab effort to protect uh, uh, those pre-stressing strands. This was kind of scary that uh, your steel components on your railings, that's what was holding it up. And if we had an errant vehicle hit it, it was, uh, may have gone into the water. So we came back and retrofitted the plate with some anchor bolts and some sap seals. So really the, the, implement, the successful implementation of seal coating and, and bridge rehab 
was basically, I, I attribute that to our past engineers for having that foresight of not pushing to the design limits or those uh, excessive limits. And basically 80, 80 foot simple spans at the time, type 54s, could have been pushed to 110 feet. But maybe they had that foresight to just go 80 feet. And uh, I think uh, in that respect, it, it, the bridge has, has behaved relatively sound over the 40 year years. Concrete diaphragms, uh, it's no longer a text dot practice, but concrete diaphragms were done at that time. And basically, uh, concrete diaphragms are to help distribute the loads. And again, we've, we've gone through several hurricanes through, through, that, uh, through that time frame. And then also precast concrete panels. That was something that was new in the 70s. And obviously, the concrete panels served as a forming mechanism, pre-stressed, put batch concrete on top. We don't have a deck problem. And then the other things that we consider good condition is these tie beams that were placed at uh, uh, inter interval points. Cathodic protection, that's also a big win, a big thumbs up, in my opinion, because um, of the uh, repairs or really what salt water does to steel, to passive steel. And our plan moving forward is that uh, we'll be stripping the, the existing coating system a fourth time. That's a typo on my part and the 20 plus uh, time frame, 2020 plus time frame. And then we're also going to implement another cathodic protection cycle. And then we also need to do a life, life cycle cost, uh, basically for continual uh, maintenance remedies beyond 2043. And Texas plans to keep the queen in good uh, condition with strategic and time-based maintenance efforts to prevent load posting and continue to serve as a lifeline uh, to the traveling public and adjacent stakeholders. So I believe with that, that kind of concludes my con uh, presentation. I wouldn't, well, it was pretty fast, but um, that's kind of a synopsis. I think at the end of the day, when the success, in my opinion, is that if you have a third party tell you what's wrong with your bridge, your district engineer or your division director will listen, as opposed to me telling them, hey, something's wrong with the bridge. You got to have somebody else tell them what's wrong and that they tend to listen. And we have it in, in writing and marching orders per se. So it's a systematic approach. Um, what made you go with the zinc flat as opposed to another product? That was a collaboration with our bridge division. Uh, I believe Tom Schwartz was on the, uh, on the previous presentation. Uh, him and also Johnny Miller recommended uh, that paint product. Um, we just found that uh, I'm not the expert. They were the kind of the experts, and they kind of um, recommended that as the Cadillac of that paint system for that type of environment. The cathodic protection is all zinc, and that's kind of the workhorse for the cathodic protection. So maybe it kind of makes sense to go with the zinc uh, paint system. Did you put the ICCD on the bridge or just the sacrificial CT? Uh, it's been a while. I can't tell you right now as far as the cathodic protection, but I do know that there was a research project on that bridge evaluating aluminum zinc, zinc, straight zinc, and uh, the consensus was that zinc was the, uh, was the uh, preferred, um, I guess, metal to use in that application. I would imagine uh, we did some sort of testing. I'm, I, wasn't, I wasn't involved in that aspect of, the, of that project. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.